Welcome in everyone on today's show. President Biden is about to raise the minimum wage for federal workers. Democrats make two huge moves on the stimulus front. We're going to go through all of the details on that in the new plan. And Bitcoin surges overnight right alongside of Tesla stock. We'll explain the marriage of these two. Uh, these two, one a coin, one a company. And new census numbers out this morning. And boy, this is the biggest population shift in American history. We're going to tell you which states are picking up congressional seats. Morning Invest starts right now. Welcome into Morning Invest. I'm Clayton Morris. This is a show that teaches you how to invest in yourself so you can become financially free. We're live right here every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So good to see everyone welcoming you to the show. Let's start with the markets and check of the markets this morning. Let's check Bitcoin this morning because surging to up 10%. Uh, I know David was uh, freaking out. Philip, do you have any uh, any Bitcoin? Do you have any Bitcoin yet? I, I do not have any Bitcoin. Nope. Well, David um, was freaking out last week because Bitcoin, you know, crapped the bed, dropped down in the low mid 40s. And I said, just hold on, just hold on. Don't worry about it. And, you know, surging once again. Obviously, a lot of targets have it hitting 100,000 this year. So bouncing back to 54, which is nice. Um, also this morning, Ethereum also up nicely as well. So bouncing up to 2,500. I actually had some price targets set for some uh, from stop losses, or sorry, price price limits so I could sell out and take some profits. So I actually took some nice profits on this when it, once it hit 2,500. Uh, so this is uh, good news and it just keeps surging this morning. Take a look at some uh, gold prices. Now, if you watch my, you watched our show yesterday, you know how bullish I am on gold right now. And look, folks, if, if $1,700 an ounce right now, this is going to be hitting, this could be hitting $2,000 uh, by July, uh, according, to the, according to the trend lines right now. Um, so gold producers, miners, companies that are t peripherally tied to gold, not even just the miners themselves, we could really be on the verge of a big gold rush um, right now. It's still in a bit of a bear market, but I think this is going to surge out here. And you're going to start to see... Uh, with the you know decline of the U.S. dollar, uh, we're already starting to see, and even the Wall Street Journal this morning, some concerns over inflation. So, as the U.S. dollar continues to to plummet, uh, you're going to see uh, you're going to see some movement there on gold. I, I forgot to play uh, silver here, so here's silver prices up nicely as well. So, precious metals also this morning should mention copper. Copper prices exploding. Obviously, demand for in the housing market right now for copper. So we we can't all these precious metals. We just don't have enough of them, and we're we're clamoring to try to get them. So copper, nickel for for environment, uh, EV cars, gold, silver, all of these uh, precious metals right now. All right, our top story this morning. Let's talk about the White House. They have uh, they have raised the minimum wage for federal contractors to fifteen dollars uh, an hour, um, and this is going to happen this afternoon. Well. President Biden's already laid it out. They released this to reporters early this morning. There was a 6 a.m. embargo, so we couldn't uh, we couldn't talk about this. Um, but uh, but President Biden, I, you know, this is one of those things where you wonder like why why the president hasn't why didn't do this like right away? Like why are we waiting so long? Uh, but it is for federal contractors, fifteen dollars an hour. And here's the fact sheet on it: the current minimum wage for federal contractors is ten dollars and ninety five cents per hour. Again, the current regular uh, minimum wage in the country is $7.25 per hour for non-federal contractors. And again, this can be changed with the stroke of a pen. So, you know, again, what's taking them so long? So it's okay for, if you're non, if you're, if you're not a government employee, screw you basically. <laughs> that's what the, that's how I read this. But this would be a big pay hike for 700,000 federal contractors who'd be covered under this order. The new wage will come into effect next year, so he's signing it today. And also, interestingly, as part of this breaking news this morning, President Biden's order will index that pay rate for inflation. Shocking. I know, right? So you'll actually carve out, um, basically, every time inflation's going up, guess what? The minimum wage goes up. Brilliant idea. That's what we've been calling for for non-federal workers for quite a while now. Also, it gets rid of that carve out, which was implemented under President Trump for seasonal recreational services on federal land, such as river, uh, river running, hunting, fishing, horseback riding, camping, mountaineering activities, recreational ski services and youth camps. 
So this executive order will promote uh, the, uh, he says, the economy and efficiency in federal contracting, providing value for taxpayers by enhancing worker productivity and generating higher quality work by boosting workers' health, morale, uh, and an effort to reduce, reduce turnover, all of that. Get the lower costs associated with recruitment and training. The Biden administration also says it will reduce absenteeism, a change that has been linked to higher productivity, not just by the employees who are more present, but by their coworkers as well. So some big news from President Biden. We're going to talk about the stimulus in just a minute because today Democrats are going to be rolling out that uh, couple of new stimulus proposals, uh, which are pretty exciting. So we'll get that. Thanks to our new channel members this morning. And uh, thanks to our super chats. If you have any questions, drop them in here in the chat and I'll be reading them throughout the show. We have a new member, James Justice. Thank you for becoming a channel member. When you support uh, our channel here, you're supporting independent journalism, not, main, not the big mainstream media companies. So thank you for becoming a channel member. You can go to morninginvest.com slash join to do that. I appreciate it. All right, we've got a lot more news to get to this morning, including Tesla. So the big news on the corporate world overnight is Tesla really defying expectations um, and earnings, blowing out the uh, gasket on earnings in between practicing his opening monologue for Saturday Night Live and firing off those Dogecoin Twitter memes, uh, Elon Musk is actually running his company pretty darn well. And his uh, Model Y car, he says, is expected to become the most popular car in the world pretty soon. Um, yes, he is going to be hosting Saturday Night Live this week, which I think is a little bizarre. I don't know. He, By the way, I don't know if you've ever seen Elon Musk give a public speech like when he has to get up and give a keynote address, he's awful. I remember watching him when he announced the new solar shingles for the solar house and the solar wall and all of that. I was like, oh my gosh, can somebody get this guy like some public speaking training? You know, he was no Steve Jobs in announcing new products. Nevertheless, he's a good CEO, I guess, because Tesla posted a record profit of $4.38 million, or in other words, $438 million, and grew the revenue 74% annually last quarter, up 74%. But the car, and the car business is going really strong. The company previously reported record Q1 deliveries of 184,000 cars, more than doubling that number from last year. It's kind of crazy to think, right? Because, I mean, a, a lot, you can think like people aren't even really driving right now doubling the amount of cars, but also the Bitcoin side of things. So Tesla bought a bunch of Bitcoin. They bought $1.5 billion in Bitcoin in February before the currency climbed to all-time highs in April. And then it sold about 10% of its Bitcoin holdings for a $101 million impact on its profits. So you know, if there's one thing we know about Tesla, things are never totally stress free, free because there are many challenges facing the company right now. China, number one, they're playing defense right now over like work, uh, customer complaints. Last week, a woman jumped on the roof of the Tesla. We showed it to you here at the Shanghai Auto Show to protest the company's handling of a crash that injured, injured her parents. The incident was all over Chinese social media, embarrassing Tesla, which is a crucial market for their EVs. And then, of course, they've got this Tesla facing another bunch of crashes, more than two dozen investigations right now from federal safety officials about whether this advanced auto system, the driver assist autopilot, played a role in recent crashes. Elon Musk in the conference call yesterday said that these people ought to be ashamed of themselves. These reporters ought to be ashamed of themselves because autopilot was not engaged in that Tesla crash that happened in Texas where they smashed into a tree. And no one was in the driver's seat. And Elon Musk yesterday said that, that, you know, that feature was not turned on during the crash. But many people think that Tesla doesn't provide enough education around the risks of self-driving features. I mean, I had a Tesla a few years ago that I leased. And I, I was scared to use that. I would put it on and sometimes, I mean, it just, it was, it did not feel safe to me. So I only did it once or twice when friends wanted to see how it worked. But you still needed to keep your hands near the wheel or on the wheel, you know. But I, you know, sometimes, and it was one time it started to pull to the one side of the road. And I'm like, eh, I just didn't feel safe about it. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. Philip, would you ever drive a, would, would you ever like let a car drive you 
No, no, not at all. Full I had a a while back. David had a Prius Prime that uh, that I I went to borrow, and I couldn't make the thing go forward. Like I don't even like a computer in my car. I like purely mechanical. <laughs> yeah, I I do not want because you know at the same time you're sitting here you're thinking are, when you're flying down like it's, you know California traffic, people flying by you. Do you want like I don't know? Just want this computer running things. No, I'd, I'd prefer everybody be awake, alert, and paying attention to what's going on. However, I mean, if you think about it, there was a story last week that says for the first time since the pandemic happened, um, COVID cases, deaths have now dropped behind, once again, automobile accident deaths in the United States. So, I mean, you think about it, like that's, we're, we're back to normal, I guess. Like the number one killer is uh, being behind the wheel of a car. And those are humans doing it, you know, mostly human error. So I think if everything was computerized and it was all working on some sort of an automated grid system where each car was speaking to the car in front of it so that they're always maintaining a certain distance and all of that, I don't know. But it's not ready for prime time yet. So, I, you know. I don't know. But what's next for Tesla? You know, I bought a bunch of Tesla stock last week ahead of their earnings, and I'm glad I did. Um, because uh, good news on this revenue growth and the, price, and the stock price shoots up. So they're all about growth. And right now, the thing with, with Tesla, which is interesting, is that they had all of these, their two main profit centers this year, were the, the two main profit centers for Tesla were these EV credits from the government, so they got millions of dollars in EV credits from the federal government. And then they also got millions of dollars in profit from buying Bitcoin. So again, their profit had little to do with their making of cars. So I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky play. But growth, 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 that's the focus this year. Tesla's going to be opening uh, those gigafactories in Austin, Berlin, Germany. And they're going to also roll out their new pickup truck and their semi truck. So... Some big growth, uh, growth for Tesla. By the way, if you want to get a free Tesla stock, you can do so by going to public um, and following me over there because I publish like a five things you need to know about in the morning story on public, and it's like a social media for stock buying. So you can go to morninginvest.com slash public and get yourself a free stock like Tesla. They give you like five different premium stocks to choose from when you sign up for free. Apple, Tesla, I think uh, Peloton, couple of uh, Beyond Meat, uh, Disney, and Amazon, I think. So get yourself a free Tesla stock just by going to morninginvest.com slash public and then follow me over there because so I have an account and it's like a social network. And, and we've actually created a club. So now you can watch the trades that I'm making and learn from the trades that I'm making. And if you, you don't want to jump into a trade, uh, it's, it's up to you because it's public. You know, Like if I buy Netflix, it pops up as an alert on your screen. So you know when I'm making a trade, and which is uh, really cool if you want to drive some additional investment. So check them out. All right, let's talk stimulus now, everyone. House Ways and Means Committee Chair uh, Rick, uh, Richard Neal, he's from Massachusetts. Today, he is unveiling a new proposal called the Building an Economy for Families Act. Neal wants to create a new entitlement giving up to 12 weeks paid family leave and medical leave for all workers. Now, this program is going to be run by the Treasury Department. Um, and so it's not clear yet how this will work. And if you had, like log into some kind of a portal on the Treasury's website, like the same way you would go there to buy Treasury bonds and stuff like that. So we're, we're not sure how it's going to roll out yet. But those at the lower end of the income scale would receive higher benefits, but private employers could be partially reimbursed for the costs if they provide benefit to their employees, which is nice for companies. Neil would also create what he calls a child care information network for families to get the most up-to-date information on child care options available to them. Um, so it, like that would include any subsidies that might be available and help figuring out how to apply for these things. Um, so all of those things would be important and as part of this uh, as part of this proposal. Um, let me pull this up here. And and if you don't know who Richard Neal is, that is that is Richard Neal right there. And he is, you know, he's in command of the House's key tax writing committee um, and uh, where he wants to get these benefits out. Like Neil wants to permanently extend three, 
three different tax credits, including the American Rescue Plan that was that were included in the American Rescue Plan passed by Congress. Number one is that child tax credit, up to thirty six hundred dollars per child. Now he wants to make this thing permanent, and he and I don't know. He's up against President Biden on this. We'll see how this shakes out because he only looks like he wants to continue it through twenty twenty five at this point. Biden does, but maybe they can get on the permanent side of things. I hope they do. He also wants an expansion of the Earned Income Tax Credit, the EITC, and the Child and Dependent Care Credit up to $8,000 for one child, $16,000 for two children or more. So it's pretty large, right? $8,000 for one child, $16,000 or more. Huge. It could be incredibly transformative across the United States to reduce childhood poverty. We don't know the costs yet for Neil's plan, but the proposal will clearly run into the hundreds of billions of dollars and could even exceed $1 trillion. He plans $1 trillion. He does plan to have this discussion um, with other Democrats. This is a discussion draft, as he says. He wants to see the House Ways and Means Committee move on this as quickly as he can. Uh, Neil came out, uh, just gave an interview about this, and he says, you know, because he's, you know, he's dealing with President Biden, who's going to have his own plan, his own American family's plan. So is this going to conflict? Uh, he met with the president on this issue. Take a listen. Change the president's mind. We're discussing those with the president right now. I want them to become permanent. I certainly want to hear what the president has to say about it. But when I met with him to talk about uh, these initiatives, he was really enthusiastic. So Neil released his proposal just one day before President Biden is set to unveil his plan tomorrow, $1.5 trillion American family plan. That's to a joint session of Congress tomorrow. It'll be interesting to see how many Democrats actually or Republicans show up to this thing because Congress is not in session. So a lot of them will have to fly back. And a lot of them are saying, we're not going to go see the president speak. It's my time off. I'm not coming to see the president. Brian D.C., the director of the National Economic Council on Monday, said about the proposal that he's been briefed on this. And he said, for our economy to fully recover from this pandemic, we must finally acknowledge that workers have families and caregiving responsibilities. They're real. He said, though, we need sensible, bold investments. We can put workers' minds at ease and ready our country to come roaring back, all while lifting millions of children out of poverty by permanently extending the expansions of the tax credits in the American Rescue Plan. Um, How are we going to pay for it? That's the big question. Neil was asked about that. How are we going to pay for this thing? And here's what he had to say on that front. I'm reluctant to embrace a direct revenue stream yet until we establish the architecture. So I think what we've tried to do is to assess need, seek testimony, and address the issue from the, the reality side, and then address the issue of appetite for the revenue that will be necessary going forward. I don't even know what that means. (laughs) That sounded like a huge word salad, didn't it? How are we going to pay for this? What's the plan here? I mean, what did you just say? That, that, that's politician speak for, I have, I'm just going to punt the football down the field. I don't know how to answer that question. Let's try that again. This is hilarious. I'm reluctant to embrace a direct revenue stream yet until we establish the architecture. So I think what we've tried to do is to assess need, seek testimony, and address the issue from the the reality side, and then address the issue of appetite for the revenue that will be necessary going forward. Oh, uh, thank you. Totally clear now. Well, let's take a little sponsor. We have a lot more news to get to today, so... Let me do this. Let me tell you about our friends over at Blue Chew. How about that? Um, And then we've got to come back and talk about some more news here. So Blue Chew, our episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. And it's been a heck of a year. People feel like they've aged like 12 years over the last 12 months. If you're like me, you're feeling your age more than you used to. So it's time to snap out of it. Spring is here. Time to get sprung with Blue Chew. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form at a fraction of the cost. Blue Chew's tablets help men achieve awesomeness (laughs) and fighting ED. 
Blue Chew is an online prescription service, so no doctor's visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy, and it ships right to your door in a discreet package. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical professionals. Once you're approved, guess what? You'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online, delivered right to you, right to your door. You can choose your plan, and guess what? You're going to try it for free. You can try it for free right now. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code INVEST at checkout. That's right. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code INVEST to receive your first month free. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring this show. I love our repeat sponsors. Come back repeatedly here on the show. Let's talk about some census data because we just got our initial results from the 2020 census. And um, drum roll, uh, the United States population grew 7.4% in the 2010s, up to 33, 331 million Americans. And that's the second, second slowest growth rate in history. It's kind of surprising to see this massive decline. The new tally will cause uh, some minor shakeups in the House of Representatives, where each state receives a number of seats to its proportional uh, relationship to population. So some takeaways on this, Texas gaining two new representatives as the political power there shifts away from the North. From the north. And California is also going to lose a seat for the first time in its 170-year history as a state. New York lost a seat. But it wouldn't have. It had. It just has. If it had oh, just eighty nine more residents, <laughs> so just eighty nine people would have accounted for not losing that uh, congressional seat. It's interesting to see. I mean, all of these people moving um, out of these different markets, uh, moving out of California, uh, moving to you know, moving down south, moving to Texas. I mean, how many of you watching right now, you know, recently moved? Um. You're seeing this huge population movement out of California into Nevada, into you know, like Las Vegas and Texas, and Texas, of course, surging. Uh, you're seeing such you know, high taxes and, uh, that are not favorable to business in states like New York and New Jersey. So they're moving out. I mean, the reasons like Idaho, like Boise, Idaho, has exploded. Um, I mean, it was last year listed as the number one housing market in the country because so many people were moving out of California. Uh, to move to a cheaper state like Idaho, uh, lower taxes, um, better for families, less traffic, cheaper costs of goods and services and everything else. Um, but the housing market right now is something's happening. You know, are we in a bubble moment? I mean, the price of lumber has shot to an all-time high. Residential home sales in the United States are at levels last seen in 2006 before the housing bubble collapsed. And stocks around the housing market right now are on a on a just an explosion home builders etc so i guess we'll find out if we're in a bubble people ask me all the time like are we in a are we in a bubble and see there is no one housing bubble there is not just one bubble even in 2008 there was not one housing bubble there was just different markets that had housing bubbles las vegas and miami and california and other places but there were other markets that actually did pretty fine during the during the 2008 collapse. And that's what's going to happen again this time. The problem this time, though, is that people can't afford homes. And so people are being priced out of these markets. Low-income, middle-income Americans can't afford these, you know, these homes. And rent is going up. That's the real crisis. And hey, if you're selling a home that's over 500000 good on you, you're making money. Over a million, good on you, you're making money. But when it comes to average Americans being able to afford these homes, they just can't. And builders can't keep up with demand right now. Um, I think this is an interesting way to look at, um, you know, in a lot of these digital trends right now as well, people just being able to jump online and buy properties, they're jumping very, very quickly. Selva Reyes says, I moved from California to Nevada in 2008, then moved back in 2012. Yeah. Are you going to move again? I mean, it seems like... Kind of crazy. Now you guys have Governor Newsom, who is about to go through a recall. Uh, that they now have enough signatures to go through the recall election. Uh, we know that uh, I think Caitlyn Jenner is going to be running for governor. Um, 
So it's a little bit crazy in California right now. But here's what we're seeing right now in the housing market. Price is not the biggest headwind I'm seeing. To your point right now, what we're seeing is, is bidding wars uh, across the nation, almost in every state. Here's the big thing I don't think people really are thinking about or talking about that much when it comes down to the housing market right now. We always talk about how tight the supply is, but why? what's the main driver why that supply is so tight? When you look at Generation X and Generation and the baby boomers, when they were sort of in their mid thirties, kind of halfway through that cycle, they were in the move up trade. They were getting out of that first time home they bought and they were getting into a, a house that was bigger. Now the biggest driver in the housing market is the millennial group. They're 27 to 41 years old. Here's the thing, they were renters or they were living at home. So as they go into buying into a marketplace, they're not putting anything back into inventory in the housing market. And I think that's the one of the major factors that's exasperating this unbelievably tight uh, inventory market that we're looking at right now. And hence, you're having bidding wars and, uh, and, and rising prices. Yeah. So these millennials who are now and with the rising cost of rent. I mean, I'm curious, anybody watching right now, like, what does your rent look like right now? Has your rent been going up? Kathy Burke says, lots of Californians moved to Portland, Oregon area before the pandemic. Result is that rents went up an average of $200. Yeah. Yeah, we actually... I'm uh, curious what in, your home... So in Oregon, we gained a, a congressional seat because uh, the past decade, we we got, uh, what, like huh. uh, over 400,000 people moved to, to Oregon uh, in the past decade. Wow. What are your average home prices? Where And you, you live where? You live... What's in... You live near Portland, right? Uh, yeah, I, I live uh, um, just uh, outside of Vancouver, Washington, but I lived in Portland for... Uh, oh, right, right, right. About 15 years. Um but I mean, it's, I mean, the average home prices, when I moved there in 2004, it was, you know, like 200,000. Now, I mean, it's, it's going to be 500,000 plus, um, rents, rents for, so in like a fairly decent neighborhood, not even an upscale neighborhood, but just a decent, uh, neighborhood, in Northeast Portland a few years back, uh, rent was like 2,600 for a three bedroom. Wow. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of people here in the chat. <clears throat> Um, so you say 14, like Laura Paddleford says $1,400 for a two bedroom in Salem, Oregon. Um, Cher Marie says rent is horrible around here over a thousand and up. No one is making minimum wage. No one making minimum wage can, can afford that. My rent is a thousand, eleven hundred dollars a month. Coney Isle says Michelle Johnson says my rent is going up. I live in Florida. Robin Mitchell says rent is over half of my income. Wow, Sarah Sela C- says six hundred and fifty dollars. I'm in a base. I'm in a basement apartment. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Joe Defer De- uh, Deford Defford says so glad we have our home. We own our home and it's paid off. Yes, and I did say Caitlyn Jenner is run is uh looking to run for governor of California. There's a couple of random people that are looking to run for. Governor of California. Addie Morris, $1,200 for a three bedroom. Oh, sorry. I missed that one. Can you go back to that one? Or are you able to go back? Yeah. Uh, Addie Morris says, $1,200 for a three bedroom house, which is unheard of. We are very blessed to pay this in Southern Utah. Yeah. So that's where people are moving, where they can, you know, they don't have to be near these big cities anymore. We're seeing, of course, the move away from the big cities when if you can live and work virtually right now, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to go to the office anymore. And Google and Facebook and all these companies giving, you know, people the opportunity to work from home. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. We had a few super chats here. Let's take them. Um, Matthew Stucer says, I ran for president of the United States in 2016 and only received a single vote. I am too progressive, Clayton and David, your turn. <laughs> you want me to run for president? All right. Uh, Ramon Lopez says, morning, Clayton, David, Philip, and Grover. I hope David recovers soon. We miss him. I know more than half the chat will relate. Get well soon, buddy. Yes. I think he's got like a migraine thing, right? I had yeah, a migraine been, one time. He's he's had a, like a continuous one for almost three days now. Oof. I had a migraine one time in junior high school. Uh, I was just telling a friend of mine the other day about this, and we were, I was just, I got to school, and I was walking down the hallway, and I looked at, teacher or something and I 
like the, I only saw like one side of their face. Like it was like a white light blocking out that vision field for me. I just felt like loopy. I went to the nurse's station and then I just got sent home and I, I, I got sick and that was it. I was, I was fine. It was normal. I was back and I've never had it again. Knock on wood. So I don't envy, I don't envy that in any of our viewers. If you have to suffer from that. Um, I saw this poll today. I thought that was pretty interesting. So a lot of people who are trying to get, um, involved in cryptocurrency take a look at this this is reasons why some consumers just aren't joining the cryptocurrency craze uh number one reason i don't trust it so philip you don't do you own any crypto uh, i don't i don't own any crypto and it's it's i'm um, looking at Where, these reasons up here um I don't trust it. I wouldn't know where to start. It's too confusing. I don't see the value. It's too risky. I can't afford to invest. It's too late now. I, I think I'm more in that Any category. Any of those apply to you? Yeah, I think I think I'm more that it's, it's too, too late. late. I should have because I I had uh, I kind of laughed it off back in what like the early 2000s when Bitcoin first hit. And I was like, this is a joke. Yeah. Back when I could have bought like three whole bitcoins for 20 bucks or something. Yeah. Well, it's crazy. And look at the market opening right now, just now. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Tesla, Tesla down a little bit this morning after it's a big, big, crazy bounce over the weekend uh, or a big, crazy bounce last week. Uh, sorry. Last night is what I'm trying to say. Uh, now, did Tesla ever buy into, did the company ever buy into Dogecoin or did, was that just an Elon Musk thing? That was just an Elon thing. They are, you know, he, I mean, so Tesla is buying, um, Tesla bought $1.5 billion of Bitcoin and then they sold, I mean, they made a ton of profit off of it. So they made $121 million profit off of that purchase of Bitcoin. And then of course, that's why this morning you're seeing Bitcoins surging because what it does is it says, Hey, this is a legitimate currency, right? Based on those Tesla results. So it kind of lifted both boats. The purchase of Bitcoin lifted Tesla's boat. And then because they did that and it showed the legitimacy of the currency, it lifted Bitcoin's boat, you know. And uh, as, a, you know, as both a long term store of value uh, and, and and more. So I think it's uh, it's interesting to look at that and, and uh, you know, as a, perhaps a replacement for gold. But I'm telling you to watch these gold prices. We're going to have some more guests here on the show in the gold space soon because I think we're heading towards a bull run in gold. Um, you know, it's in that 17 range right now. It's still bearish, but over the next few months, the the, the, the signals the signals are pushing it towards uh, towards the 2,000 range. Uh, as the U.S. dollar continues to be printed, you know, people, how are we going to pay for all of this? Where, where's the government going to actually get some money? Well, we're going to have to raise taxes, right? So you're going to have to raise taxes. Uh, the, you know, President Biden apparently today could announce his capital gains tax increase on the wealthy, on wealthy Americans at the, you know, the 1% of Americans that would end up paying this, this tax to begin with. Those Many Republicans say that's a non-starter. We don't want to see it raise, raising revenue that way. So this weekend, Chris Christie um, is being, I think apparently is, is considering running for president. And could he become a you know, Republican formidable front runner? But he, he said something ridiculous that he just got shut down this Sunday calling tax increases socialism. I want you to watch this. It's pretty funny. Well, he overturned this executive order. Executive order. That's not what we were talking about this morning. What Sarah just talked about, the capital gains issue is nothing more than income redistribution. Mm -hmm. It's socialism. <laughs> Joe's Biden, Joe Biden's proposal to do that. Let's remember that that investment income, they've already paid taxes yeah. on it. You paid taxes on it before you invested it. And now you're going to pay taxes on it again at the same rate that you pay. But it, oh. a difference in, in, in the rate it changes the capital gains tax into socialism? It sure, of course it does. It's redistribution of income, George. And, and I just want to warn everybody out there, wait until you see what happens to your retirement funds. Oh. If Joe Biden gets a 39.6% capital gains, wait till you see what happens to the market. And as most people in America who have their IRAs and their 401ks and self-directed retirement, 
invested in the stock market, they're going to see their retirement income and their college savings income in 529s drop significantly. It's so That's going to be the problem. It's, it's so interesting to, to, to hear this um, allegation of socialism. I know these are buzzwords that work very well with the Republican Party, so congratulations for using them this morning. But I think what is so interesting is we have people in the middle of a pandemic that you said wouldn't matter by the time we get to the fall. And on... And on the left, there's a conversation happening about student loan debt, how much should be forgiven, 50000 versus 10000 And we're talking about a capital gains increase when you all just had basically the reparations that my community has been asking for in your last tax proposal. So I don't even understand what we're talking I, about here. I, I, I just want to well, say, think... first... <laughs> oh. Pretty good. And it gets better, though, because this idea that a capital gains tax increase on 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 stock trades is redistribution of wealth no it's paying your fair share in a tax system that is broken so again how is it that warren buffett's secretary pays a higher percentage of income to taxes than does warren buffett because he is taxed differently as a wealthy individual it's not a redistribution of wealth. It's inequality in the tax code is what it is. That's how it comes down. Not a redistribution of wealth. First off, let's correct this idea you already paid on your capital gains. You paid on the initial investment, which then you only pay on the actual gains from the initial investment. So, so let's not say you already paid taxes on it. You're actually you earning income. You're actually getting dividends or you're getting interest or you're, you, when you sell it, you make money. And this is one of the biggest scams in the history of forever on income redistribution. If you have a tax, if you have a, 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 uh, a um, stock, you can pass it on to your kids with stepped-up basis, and it's never taxed. You know that there needs to be reform in unearned income. No. And, and no. so to, to demonize it and say it's going to hurt the little guy, yeah, that just is not factual, yeah. Chris. And it you is know. Well, it there's, there's, the there's proposals. Hmm. Smackdown. That's pretty good. Smacking Chris Christie down. Do you think he'd be a good president? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. He got sort of out-trumped. You know, he was the, he was the, in many ways, he was the, uh, the, he was the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, contrarian candidate. He was the one that wasn't afraid to tell it like it is. He did very well in the debates. He was leading at one point. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, you know, this is what happens. He got out, he got outmaneuvered. You know, Trump was more exciting to that particular base. And uh, just he didn't have anywhere to go. Um, and he got outmaneuvered um, on that. And so, you know, it'd be interesting to see if, if Trump does not run, if, if Chris Christie runs. Um, but this is where he comes down. People saying, no way, absolutely not, Nathaniel. No way, nope, nope, nope. Heck no, he was a terrible go uh, governor. Um, two words, Verrazano Bridge. Yeah, I, I don't know how you get around Bridgegate. Um. Uh, when you lock down an entire bridge so a community, you know, can't get to work. Um, well, no, he's not running for president yet, Derek, but we're, uh, you know, he, he could. Um, uh, last week, we got word that he's considering a run. Um, right, Tina C. says he closed the beach and he was on the beach. I mean, but do people care about that stuff anymore? Like, do people really care? You know, I mean, after the stuff that we went through with Trump... Like him closing a beach, does that even really register anymore? I mean, think about the stuff that we just went through. We had a president of the United States who literally had paid hush money uh, to a porn star. Like, okay, how do you go? How do you even get anywhere close to that again? So now we're we're now these are the things we're focused on. Like he was at the beach. This is the, these are the scandals we focus on. President Biden's dog bites a member of the Secret Service. Like that's these are the things we have to deal with. Yeah, I'm um, I'm personally uh, scandaled out. Like I just like completely numb to any more scandals. It's like oh yeah, <laughs> there's a scandal. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised about any of this stuff anymore. You know, um, and I I think we've just become so desensitized to it that you know it used to be that oh my god. If you would remember Bill Clinton couldn't really admit that he didn't, you know, inhale 
uh, marijuana. Like that was the thing that could have kept him from the presidency. Right. And now like, Oh yeah, I smoke marijuana. Like president Obama admitted it. I mean, it's like, you know, of course this I mean, is just how, look at we how just, like now we're just so, I was gonna say, look at how bad we went after Dan Quayle for what misspelling potato or was it tomato? Right. <laughs> yeah. It was potato. Yeah. 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 I mean, look how people mocked Bill Clinton for the I didn't inhale thing, you know? Um, just Now just I kind of wish most of them would. Just chill yeah, out. Yeah, just admit it. Yeah. <laughs> I saw an anchor the other day. I saw an anchor uh, on uh, on one of the business networks the other day. I was tuned in for a minute, and, and he said, he said, I, you know, he said, I can't, I can't, I can't pretend that I didn't, you know, smoke marijuana. He goes, I'm a child of the 70s. He's like, Come on. I think he's like, that ship has sailed. But back in the day, you could have never admitted that on network television like that, you know. So, I don't know. I think we are scandaled out. Yeah. So, uh, let's read some of your... Let's read some of your super chats here. Let's keep over. Bitcoin at 54000 right now. Up nicely. Ethereum up. Dogecoin also up this morning. Um, yeah, overall, overall, we're looking good in the markets today. So Coinbase, though. Coinbase still at like three. That's the thing on Coinbase. Like, you know, people bought into this. It's down. It's down to about 304 after skyrocketing up to 415. Um Bank of America, all these big banks, by the way, posted like huge earnings. So Bank of America, I covered this yesterday on the show a little bit, but look look at Bank of America, Citigroup, all of these guys like skyrocketing prices um, because they made so much money off of people in the pandemic. You know, they made so much money off of all of these overdraft fees because people couldn't pay their bills. And then these people are getting charged $35 an overdraft every day. Now, I had a back when I made no money and I was really in trouble financially back when I was in my 20s. I was I had student loan debt. I was not making any money at my job, making very little money. And you know, I lived on the margins. I lived paycheck to paycheck and I sometimes I would have overdrafts and then when you got an overdraft, it would compound itself like the next day it'd be another one and another one and it just would start building up. And that's how all these banks are making profit. Should be illegal. These overdraft fees should be illegal. What do you guys think about that in the chat? The reason that they don't just stop you from buying stuff is because they make money off of you getting these overdraft fees. Like, here's an idea. What if your account has nothing in it at zero? Guess what? Then you can't use the account until more money is in the account. But no, the banks want to make some some cheddar on top of that. So they'll let you just keep burying yourself. My bank kept resetting my default. Uh, back to because uh, I kept shutting off uh, just like no don't ever overdraft like just you know don't approve anything if it's at zero and then uh, every several months they reset the default when they update and then it resets that default back to uh, yep. th- thieves yeah yeah like you went in there and set it so that it would be zero and you couldn't be charged and then sure. when they give a software update they flip it back the default back to allowing you to get a, uh, an overdraft fee it's garbage. It's garbage. And that's one of the big ones. Too, yeah, it is loan sharking. Your Imperial Majesty says that overdraft is loan sharking. Exactly it is. It's exactly what it is. It takes it takes advantage of of people it takes advantage of people. It takes advantage of low and middle income Americans and it keeps some people in a uh cycle, you know, a cycle of poverty. How are you ever supposed to get ahead? You know, I had so many overdrafts over the years and it crushed me. And Bank of America was kind enough. I went to them and I said, look, I don't know what happened. And they were able to like go in and reverse it. I met with one of their team members at the branch. Like if this happens to you, they have the power at the branch to be able to remove some of these and say, I don't know what happened. I just, you know, I, I, it, it, I didn't get this alert or something happened. I don't know. Just be honest with them. And they'll see if they can remove it. They, If you meet with one of the bankers, they'll sit down. They can go through. I had to do this a lot. It was embarrassing. But you shouldn't have to be embarrassed because this is a system that preys on people. 
So Chris Christie can sit there and say, you know, all these rich people on Wall Street that are, you know, going to have to pay a capital gains tax. Socialism. Yeah. While you're sitting there on the beach, fat and happy, and Americans are suffering, this is income redistribution. Have you been to New Jersey, the state that you were the governor of? Have you driven through Newark? Have you seen the poverty and the income inequality in your state, Governor Christie? Where, you know, you could go to Morristown and pay, you know, a million dollars for a, a, a you know, five-bedroom house. Pay taxes through the roof, and yet people are suffering like that in that state. And Ridiculous. you look at these, like, overdraft fees and stuff like that. Nobody's, why, why is nobody calling that income redistribution? Because that's exactly what that is. That's actually taking people's income and redistributing it somewhere else. <laughs> right. Right. It's going... And you see that in the profits. I mean, Bank of America's profits off the charts. Chase, JP Morgan, like all these banks, all driven by this, um, all these overdraft fees. That's the thing. Um, it, you know, it's just, it's just so disturbing. Um, by the way, one thing I should mention today, I forgot to mention this, that Apple today uh, rolled out. You can update your iPhone if you have an iPhone or any iOS device. If you if you are sick and tired of being tracked by these companies, by like Facebook or any of these companies that track everything you do online, if you update your iPhone, the new software basically puts a warning up on an app. When you launch an app like Facebook, it'll say, hey, this app is tracking you. Do you want to or not? Uh, Gills Skills says, I got charged a $35 overdraft fee for a $3.90 Dunkin' Donut coffee purchase. LOL. I quickly barked at that and got it removed. Yeah. So you can do that. You can go into your bank and they'll, they'll usually remove them. The problem that I had is that I had, I was getting these overdraft fees repeatedly. I mean, like to the point where I had like 20 in a year. It was just crushing me. Um, and they said, we can only remove like two a month or one a month or something. I'm like, well, I've got like seven this month. No bueno. So here is uh, the Apple news. Apple released their new iPhone update. This is the one that Facebook has been worried about for months. It adds a lot of new features, but one that's, of course, been everyone's been talking about is the new privacy change. So when you, it'll say, hey, this app is tracking you. Um, do you want to allow that to happen or not? Um, and then now these these advertisers, oh, oh, you know, won't be able to track you across the web, basically. Um, so Facebook's not happy about that. Another cool feature about this new software update is that now, if you're wearing a mask and you're wearing an Apple Watch simultaneously, you won't have it, the Face ID is blocked, obviously, because the mask. But now the Apple Watch will let you unlock your phone um, with your wrist, which is a much needed feature. Um, so the way to do this to get it set up, just go to your settings menu on your iPhone, go to general, go down, click on software update. Then if you want to turn on the face ID with your Apple watch, just go to settings, tap face ID and passcode, put in your passcode and then scroll down and click unlock with Apple watch if you have that set up. So, good stuff if you're an Apple user, as I am. And uh, But I love the fact that they're like trying to stick it to these companies that are tracking you and making money off of like following you all over the web. So good for them. Good for them. Let me see what other super chats we all have right. today. Yeah, we got a couple of them here. Um, the first one I didn't I didn't grab this one in time, but uh, Darren Williams said I owe fifty three thousand on my home and it's worth three hundred and forty one thousand. He paid one hundred and twenty seven thousand twenty one years ago. The rent there is an average of sixteen hundred wow. per month. That was a five dollar super chat. Thank you for that. So then we got sorry I put that on the screen. The illustrative carp four ninety nine super chat. Oh yeah was charged a $105 overdraft for being 58 cents overdrawn by a $2 fee they charged me. 
Jeez. So they charged you a $2 fee. That put you overdrafted, and then you were charged $105. It's ridiculous. They're all thieves. All thieves. Matthew Stusser, the state's the state's election requirements are rigged to prevent common people from running. You have a pla you have, you have a platform and followers who will help you help us. Thank I you. I think Matthew. that's back in reference to you running for president. Right. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Lisa Pettit, is there a difference in value in gold bars versus gold coins? Are there advantages, disadvantages to either? Good question. Um, the only difference is the uh, the size and weight of it. Like if you're going to buy, I would encourage you to buy physical gold. Um, you know, we use the, the company that I use. If you go to um, morninginvest.com slash gold, uh, I use the Birch Gold Group. That's who I use. And you can go there and get a free gold kit so you can learn about how to do it. So just go there and grab it for free at morninginvest.com slash gold. But they sell gold coins and silver coins. And so they'll send actual gold coins to your house. And right now, through the end of April, they're giving away a free safe. So April 30th, if you use them, you'll get a free safe to store your gold in. So that's the physical gold. Um, you can also invest in companies that they'll store it for you in vaults, um, like in the Swiss Alps and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the only difference between gold coins and gold bars is that it's just the size of it. Like... You know, I think we just we're so used to seeing what gold looks like as a bar, you know, but that's like I don't know how many gold coins that would be. Just the weight of it. That's like, I don't know, 50 gold coins in one bar. I don't I don't even know. And that was all I use my gold. I use my I use my gold bar. OK, I use my gold bars as um as as door as door stops so that, you know, when it gets windy, just the doors don't shut. I'm sure, Philip, you do the same thing with all your gold bars. You just put them so that, you know, it's a good door stop. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 keeps the, it keeps the cat from opening the bathroom door when I'm sitting on my golden toilet. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You just got to be careful, though. I stub my toe on my gold bars all the time. It hurts. It hurts. You really got to be careful about that. Thanks to all of our new channel members this morning. Lisa Trudeau is a new channel member. You can support independent journalism, the only morning business show that actually cares about you, not Wall Street. That's our focus here is helping you build wealth and helping you stay away from these thieving, thieving uh, big businesses that want to rip you off. So you can become a channel member by going to morninginvest.com slash join is the way to do it. By the way, if you are a fan of the paranormal, tonight we'll have finally... A new paranormal post video. So if you go to the par you know, if you watch my other YouTube channel, youtube.com slash paranormal post, we've got a new video about a haunting in the in the the, the hills of Denver uh, outside in Colorado. It's a creepy story about a house um, that's been investigated by many, many high profile investigators, and this house is like off the charts. So we're going to feature that story on the Paranormal Post. If you're into Paranormal News, News of the Unexplained, go to youtube.com slash Paranormal Post. You can check it out. So if you want to check out the channel tonight, we'll have a new video there tonight for you to, to indulge in. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah, one more thank super you, everyone. Don't forget in. to go get... Oh, okay. And that's from Kathy. Yeah. Kathy. I track water flows in the West and we are in deep trouble and Lake Powell, Lake Mead are both around 35% full and they supply the West move North or East. Yeah. We had a story last week in the newsletter about um, just the huge water problems and water shortages. I mean, look, Kamala Harris said the next wars in the United States will be fought over, over war, uh, over um, water, not oil. Because, you know, such a scarce resource. Um, I think if you're moving, that's the thing. Like, people move to Nevada. They move to Las Vegas and these places that, like, literally shouldn't even exist there. Like, there's no way, unless artificial air conditioning 
and stealing water from like the Colorado River. Like, should these cities even exist? Yeah, like Phoenix. And then on top of it, <laughs> Phoenix, exactly. Didn't Phoenix, well, I know that Vegas just outlawed watering a, well, I don't know what they called it, decorative or ornamental grass. So yeah, if you're watering ornamental grass. The, the Phoenix area, I think, has always had, or had something like that for quite a while, because I lived there in uh, 97. I lived uh, in Casa Grande. And uh, they had, I mean, it was like all the lawns were stone, because, I mean, having grass was right. ridiculous. It's like having a golden toilet. <laughs> right. But I mean, it, I, I remember pictures yeah. from, uh, from like hydrology class in, in college where uh, there were there were water wars in the 30s and 40s between Nevada and Arizona where they actually were putting uh, militias on the borders protecting each other's water supplies because they were all those those cities when they were just springing up were trying to steal each other's water. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and think about the way that they divert water from the Colorado River and, you know, it's who gets what, who's a lot, and then, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's bad. So these cities that really shouldn't even exist, and it's only going to get worse as the as the Earth continues to get hotter and hotter. So, um, I don't know. Yeah, move north or east, I guess, or south. I don't know. I guess down like you know, down the in in you know Texas and um, uh, and and Florida, where they actually get rain every day. But it's humid as heck down there. This is when the humidity starts. It's April in Florida. I used to live in Orlando, and November to April was beautiful. No humidity. And then it's like April, that's when the humidity starts in Florida. And it's just like, oh, don't want to be outside all summer. Kristen Swenson, thank you for your super chat. Spending all my time crafting the great billionaire takedown, <laughs> replacing current corrupt business models with ethical ones, baby steps. Thank you for this show and all it has taught me and the value it brings. Thank you for being a great part of our community here, Kristen. Much love to you. Thank you so much. Very sweet of you. Ethic, you know, that's the thing. I invest in ethical businesses um, or in the research I try to do is making sure that like the things I'm investing in is empowering. So cryptocurrency is not a fiat currency. It's outside of the mainstream. It's not manipulated by these corrupt governments. And investing in companies that I believe in that are also ethically minded, um, who are taking great strides to be more ethically minded, making huge advancements in carbon neutrality, et cetera. Um, so those are really important things things to me. By the way, speaking of which, Honest Brands, uh, Jessica Alba's company is about to launch their IPO. Stock price. So there's a company, research Jessica Alba's Honest company. Um, I think they're going to IPO at like $14 a share. Um, fourteen Between $14 and $16 a share. So that's an interesting one to watch as well. All right, everyone. Thanks for a wonderful show. Thanks, Philip, for uh, for filling in for David today. Yeah, yeah. Get no early problem. with us. And uh, yes, he is not he is not fake David. He is he is his own person. Uh, you could Although call me Discount beard, David, maybe. Mustache. Discount David. <laughs> discount David. That's where I used to go to get all my uh, all my pots and pans when I was in con Discount David's. <laughs> discount daves all right much love to all of you grover says thanks everyone we will see you back here bright and early tomorrow morning at 9 a.m eastern time please share this with your friends subscribe to the channel turn on that little bell notification so you'll be notified when we publish a new show we'll see you tomorrow everyone <laughs>